after that piece by Van Gregg said to me just a moment ago, uh, we could just do the, the invitation now. You're not getting off that easy, but I thought about it for a second. I thought about it. If you've got your Bible this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. This morning we're going to read verses 18 through 25 of Matthew 1. Past couple of weeks, we have been in this series entitled Heaven and Earth, where we've been looking at the ways in which we see the blending of the ordinary and the extraordinary in these infancy narratives of Matthew chapters 1 and 2 and Luke chapters 1 and 2. The ways that we see on the one hand carpenters and peasant girls and priests and shepherds, and on the other hand we see angelic visitations and messages in dreams and heavenly hosts and stars guiding wise men. There's this incredible confluence happening between heaven and earth in these stories, and it all culminates, of course, with the Word becoming flesh and living among us in Christ our Lord. And so two weeks ago, we didn't even get to Jesus quite yet. We were talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth, these two who would be parents to John the Baptist, and about the visitation by an angel to them to announce his birth. Last week, we got to Mary and her angelic visitation by Gabriel, as she was told that she would be the mother of of the Savior, and this morning we get the second half of that family, Joseph's angelic visitation, this time in a dream. So follow along as I read, starting in Matthew 8, chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Let's pray over the message of that passage. Lord, we thank you for the obedience of your servant Joseph. We thank you for the message he was given, these words which resonate with us even today. For this name of Jesus, this one who came to save, for this Emmanuel, who is God with us. Lord, I pray that this message would honor that same Jesus, would revere that same Emmanuel, and Lord, that it would touch our hearts and our lives. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. In 2018, coming up on 2019, we are used to having choices. We are used to having a lot of choices. Nothing is quite as illustrative of this fact to me as the menu at Cheesecake Factory. We don't have one in Waco, so you may not have been to that particular restaurant. I went for the first and only time a few years back on a trip to Dallas, and at a place called the Cheesecake Factory, I thought I knew what I was in for. I thought I had a pretty decent idea of what they had to offer until I was handed the menu, this spiral-bound menu. Not one page, not one page front and back. No, 21 pages of menu. Sandwiches, burgers, salads, soups, cheesecakes, and more and more and more and more and more. There are over 250 items on the Cheesecake Factory's menu. 
I'm not sure how long I spent looking at that menu, but I do know I didn't look at the whole thing. I know I hit a certain point where I just said, I will just, I, I'll have a burger. I don't care. I, this is too much. I cannot handle all that is on this menu. Just give me, just give me a burger. A lot of times that's how modern life works these days. We always have lots of choices. Whether you're buying a car, whether you're choosing the channel on the television, whether you're a college student choosing a major or a class, it seems like there is always a lengthy list of options. We don't have to settle very often. It's not very normal for someone to tell you this is how it's going to be, period, in the story. We're so used to having all of these choices, we're so accustomed to it, there's a name for it now. The paradox of choice, a psychologist calls it. And it's that feeling that you get when you're standing in the cereal aisle, standing before 60 different kinds of cereal, and instead of being happy by the amount of choices you have, you feel paralyzed by all of the choices. Standing there wondering, how am I supposed to possibly choose? We're used to having choices. So, when you do come to that rare situation, that unusual scenario in which something is predetermined for you, when you come to a spot in life where someone does tell you, this is how it's going to be, you don't have a choice in the matter. When something is predetermined for us, we almost can't help but resent it a little bit. What do you mean I don't have a choice? What do you mean I have no options? When something is predetermined for us, it just rubs us the wrong way. That brings us to our scripture this morning and to our subject, which is the very will of God. <clears throat> Each week in this series, we've been talking about this relationship between heaven and earth and how it comes about in these stories. And today, through the story of Joseph, we get a look at the will of God. God's will for his people, God's will for individuals. There's different perspectives, of course, on how God's will functions, what God's will looks like. At one extreme... You've got those who say that everything in your life is predetermined by God. That is, he who is creator, he who is sovereign, who you marry, where you live, whether you will be saved or not, all of it was set in stone eons before you were ever born. That's one extreme of the spectrum. At the other extreme... We've got this idea that God is the one who created the universe, created the heavens and the earth, set everything in motion, and then stepped back. And said, y'all take it from here. That God has not interfered in the affairs of his universe ever since. Those are your two extremes. The truth, as you might suspect, is somewhere in the middle. Confirmed by scripture, confirmed by reason, confirmed by personal experience. The truth is somewhere in the middle. We serve and we worship a God who acts in human history. Who works in the lives of people. Who accomplishes his will through people. Who gives us freedom, but nevertheless works through us. But you may wonder, you may have this nagging concern when you hear that. If God works through people, if God enacts his will through us, doesn't that then mean that some element of choice has been taken away from us? If he tells us what to do, if he accomplishes his work through us, then doesn't that mean we're just puppets whose strings are being is it worth believing in? Is it worth following a God who would take choices out of our hands? In search of an answer to that question, I look to Joseph's story here in Matthew chapter 1. 
Because again and again in this story, we see choices being taken away from Joseph. Joseph, we know from elsewhere in Scripture as well as from this chapter, was a carpenter by trade. We know that he was from the line of King David. His ancestry dated back to that king in Israel's golden age. We know that he was engaged to a peasant girl named Mary. Engagements back in those days were not quite like the informal arrangements we have today, where somebody gets on one knee, puts a ring on her finger, and then nothing really changes until the wedding day. It was a little more formal back then. It was a legal contract. In a sense, you were already married when you were engaged, but the wedding had not yet occurred and the marriage had not yet been consummated. But legally speaking, you were one. That's who Joseph is when we come into this passage. He's got his life pretty well set up. His career is already established. His home is already established. His family is already all set to go. His life is set right until it's not. Because when this passage begins, his fiance, his wife, Mary, is found to be pregnant. Now, the narrator here, the Apostle Matthew, he tells us that it's by the Holy Spirit. Joseph didn't know that. Even if Mary had told him this, which is unlikely, who's going to believe that story? Joseph was not aware of the origins of this child growing within Mary. He was simply aware that his fiancée was suddenly pregnant and he wasn't the dad. This is the reality that he was confronted with. We as the reader, we as believers hearing this story, we understand where this child did come from. We believe Matthew's words that this child was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but that means something. That means that a choice had been taken from Joseph. Joseph's first child did not come through his action. The first boy in Joseph's family was not his. His choice in that matter had been taken away from him by God. God was working in his life and he didn't even know it. And I'll tell you, church, that's the way God's will works sometimes. Sometimes God is working in your life and you don't even realize he's doing it. He's working through your friends. He's working through your family. He's working even through a message you hear on a Sunday morning. He is moving your heart and he is moving your life. And you're not even aware he's doing it. So confronted with this information, Joseph has to now make a new choice. He had had his path set before him, but now he's got to alter it slightly. His wife-to-be, Mary, is pregnant, and he's got to make a decision about what to do from here. Because this means scandal for him, for his family. This means social disgrace. He's got to decide what he's going to do about that. He's got some choices here. On the one hand, he can publicly divorce her. He can announce to all who are gathered before him, he can announce to the community what Mary has done, what she is presumed to have done. He can label her an adulterer with the proof right before their eyes, and she will suffer the consequences under the law, even unto death. If he divorces her publicly, that is what will happen. She will have to suffer the consequences under the law the law, he'll get off scot-free, of course. Option number two <coughs> is he can stay with her and suffer that public humiliation, that social disgrace to come with it. He can be labeled a cuckold for the rest of his life. That's option number two. And there's option number three, which is to quietly divorce her. To give no reason to the community, to simply say, in our modern parlance, and it didn't work out. As the man in the relationship, in the patriarchal, patriarchal society, he has that right. He can cut things off whenever he wants to. Mary didn't have that privilege. 
He can simply say, I've dismissed her. Her services are no longer required and give no reason. That's the option that Joseph goes with. It's the moderate option. It's the reasonable option. That's the choice he makes with choice having been taken from him. But God's not done with Joseph yet. God's not finished with him. So God steps in again, this time in a dream. And this is where we see heaven touching earth in the story. Joseph is visited in a dream by an angel. For anybody who knows their Old Testament, this is a familiar paradigm we get here. Abraham was visited in dreams. Jacob was visited in dreams. Joseph, the son of Jacob, was visited in dreams. Daniel, Solomon, the list goes on and on and on. This is a way God communicates with his people when he wants to get a message across. And so, sure enough, this angel comes with a message for Joseph. A message that Mary's child does not have a father like Joseph, but rather has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. That this child is the one who is the Messiah, Joseph, and the rest of Israel have been waiting for. This child is special. This child is the one who will save Joseph's people. That's the message, but don't lose track of what else there is. Not merely a message, but an order, a command. A command from this angel of the Lord that because of this, because this child is special, because this child is the Christ, Joseph, you've got a responsibility. Don't dismiss Mary. Don't divorce her. Stay with her. She will bear this son and you are to be a father to him. And now all of a sudden, we see another choice has been yanked away from Joseph. Story goes on after that, beyond verse 25 where we stopped. Get the story in Luke chapter 2 that you know well about how Joseph and Mary have to go to Bethlehem. There's this government order, this census that's been undertaken. And so because of that census, Joseph has another choice taken from him. He has to go to Bethlehem, has to go to this place that he otherwise would not have gone to the place of his birth. After that, after the child is born... He then has to flee to Egypt because Herod, the king of that region, wants his son dead. Doesn't know his son's name, doesn't know his son's parentage, but knows that the Messiah has been born and he wants him killed. So now another choice is taken from Joseph. He has to flee to a land he does not know as a refugee. Well, after Herod dies, he doesn't get to return home. Not quite yet. Given his brother, he'd go back to Judea where he'd been raised but he's worried about Herod's son, that he might still be seeking the Christ child. So instead, he settles down in the province of Galilee in a little village called Nazareth, and that is where Jesus is raised. It is clear from Scripture that Joseph's entire life is utterly reshaped by God. The Joseph introduced in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 the plans he had for his life do not come to fruition. What he might have wanted his family to look like is not what his family winds up looking like. What his life would look like for the next few years, utterly different from what he had in mind. Even what his family looks like is not what he had in mind. Because of God, because of the will of God, because God acts through Joseph and Mary, Joseph sees choice after choice after choice taken away from him. So my question this morning, is that fair? Is that right? Is that just? I suspect it's something more. Because of what the angel said. Hear the angel's words again in verses 22 and 23. This message in a dream from an angel to a carpenter. All this took place 
to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Joseph did not get the life he had planned. It's as simple as that. Joseph did not get the life he had planned. Instead, he got Jesus. Joseph didn't get to see his plans fulfilled. Instead, he got Emmanuel. God with us. Let me tell you, church, that is the essence of the new covenant which Jesus brought with his life and his death and his resurrection. This covenant which God initiates, in which God reaches out to us, and our choice is whether to accept it or not, to receive it or not. God says, I have emptied myself, ultimately, even to the cross. And so I call you to empty yourself. I have sacrificed, I call you to sacrifice. I have given, I call you to give. I have loved, I call you now to love. <coughs> God's will asks something of us. God's will takes away what we, in our mortal foolishness, might call some sense of freedom in the name of something better in the name of someone better. In the Broadway musical Wicked, the final song in that show is sort of an ode to the friendship between the two characters. But a line from the chorus speaks, I think, to what this is getting at here. Like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes a sun, like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better? But because I knew you, I have been changed for good. I tell you, church, life is full of choices. But the gospel ultimately distills those choices down to one, the one that really matters. You can follow your own way, Follow your own will. And when you do so, you will remain as you've always been. <clears throat> Foolish, weak, mortal, sinful. You can do that. You can remain as you've always been by following your own way and your own will. Or you can trust and obey the holy, saving, loving God who is with us. And be changed. Change 